Uh, I am really grateful for those of you who are here. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility as uh, those of you, and I see, I think nearly everyone, if not everyone in the, in the audience is recognizable to me. Uh, and I therefore know that all of you have been on similar pilgrimages uh, as the one that Bruce and our friend Tarak Koff just took to Okinawa. And we know that a great responsibility comes with those privileges. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to uh, discharge that responsibility a little bit. Um, I'm going to read much of what I have to say in hopes that that will preclude me missing a lot of important information that I want to pass along. I like this phrase, Nuchi du Takara. Uh, it is the mantra that the Okinawan activists use. And I think, uh, to me, it's founded in their history, and it comes from their heart, and it is fundamental to their spirit. I wear this t-shirt, my Nuchi du Takara t-shirt, not because or not just because I like the t-shirt, but it does prompt the question often, you know, what does that mean? And it gives me a chance to expound on those things that I want to talk about today. I know there are several of you here who have been to Okinawa in the past. This was the, I think, Bruce might correct me here, but I think this was the fourth delegation of Veterans for Peace activists that has gone there in the last several years. Tarak and Bruce have been, uh, they've assumed leadership roles in each of those delegations. Uh, Tarak, as you may know, is a longtime National Veterans for Peace director, and he has been, I think it's fair to say, the architect and the inspiration behind this initiative of Veterans for Peace. Uh, he has sponsored or led uh, or conceptualized a couple of trips to Jeju, a couple of trips to Okinawa, and uh, more than, I think, well, a couple anyway to the West, Point of, West uh, Bank of Palestine. Uh, and Bruce, as all of us know here, is perhaps the single activist, the activist who has most informed the general American public as to the excesses and the wages of our militarism. That's hardly an exaggeration. On this occasion, we went in response to a request for international support from leaders of the Okinawa Anti-Base Action Committee. Recent developments in Okinawa had convinced these men and women uh, that the time was crucial to the general movement to close U.S. air bases on Okinawa, but particularly were they focusing on the uh, relocation of a Marine Corps air station at Futenma to a place called Honoko, north of Futenma. The committee of the leaders had postulated that if citizens numbering four to 500 gathered in front of the gates during the period of time, April 23rd through the 28th, that they could definitely stop these convoys of uh, materials that were brought in, being brought into Hinoko to advance the project there. Uh, instrumental to the picture altogether has been Okinawa Governor Takeshi Onaga. Uh, we'll talk about him, I think, as we go along, but his role has really been critical. In 2014, he was elected as the governor of Okinawa with 100,000 majority uh, with a 100,000 voter majority. So he had great support, and that support was really based on his position in opposition to this relocation at, at Hanoko. So the activist leaders were called upon from around the world to join uh, in, in opposition to uh, what was happening at this, uh, at this location. Knowing something of Okinawa's geography and their history provides a necessary background uh, a context to enable an understanding of why they are so exercised about uh, our presence in their, on their island. So what follows over the next several slides is, a base, is basically just a primer. Okinawa is located about 400 miles south of the Japanese mainland and an equal distance from the Chinese mainland. Uh, the island itself is about 70 miles long by maybe seven miles wide. It has been part of the so-called Ryukyu Kingdom, or had been for several centuries leading up to 1879 when Japan annexed the island and made it one of its prefectures, one of its states. Its relative remoteness had dictated that those people had a different culture and a different language, very distinct from that of uh, the people on the Japanese mainland. And those distinctions determined that Okinawa would suffer lasting discrimination at the hands of the national government. Say, so please interrupt me if a, if a question arises through this. The consequences for being Okinawan really took a drastic turn during World War II. 
and have continued largely in large part ever since that time. <clears throat> in, in World War II, the Battle of Okinawa swept across the island, the Japanese having determined that they would make their stand there rather than on the Japanese mainland and thereby sparing those people on the mainland the devastation of a land invasion. So in the so-called Typhoon of Steel, 120,000 civilians of a population of about 460,000, maybe one in every four, were killed. During the post-war years, the U.S. confiscated many people's lands, perhaps displacing as many as 250,000 people on the island to make way for various bases that we constructed there. It's interesting that on April 28th in 1952, the Treaty of San Francisco was signed, ending the occupation of the Japanese mainland, but not of Okinawa itself. And so Okinawa remained under the control and the governance of the United States for the next uh, 20 or so years. And that date is observed to this day, April 28th, as the Day of Humiliation. It's a day that commemorates when the Okinawans became second-class citizens and have uh, continued to suffer that ignominy or that sort of treatment ever since. So today there remain 32 military bases on Okinawa. It's very much a symbol of the occupation or the colonization of that island. And it uh, sort of proves the absence of a truly independent and a democratic Japanese government. These, are, these give you an idea of the uh, disproportionate burden that Okinawa suffers relative to the Japanese mainland itself and the people there. So the Japanese, or the Okinawan public, really wants all the bases gone. They want them eliminated. This is the Tenma Air Base that's located in the middle of a central city called uh, Jinawan. It has a population of about 100,000. And of course, uh, uh, along with this picture that we see here goes a great deal of uh, a, a much hazard to the local population. It's ridiculous that an airport exists in such a, a populated area. So the US and Japan agreed that it ought to be relocated. And the problem is, though, there's no place on Okinawa that would be acceptable to the, Jap to the Okinawan people. <clears throat> The US and Japan national government decided regardless they would relocate to this place near Camp Schwab, an existing Marine Corps base. And uh, it would involve uh, landfill over the areas that you see delineated by the white lines here. And the construction project is now underway. It entails two V-shaped runways, as we see here. And it would require a landfill of about 375 acres of pristine waters and an investment of over $3 million. I'm sorry, B with a billion, with a, with a B, billion with a B. <clears throat> this, in my mind, is the poster child of desecration of environment, militarism, and the arrogance of empire. So this is the world that we inserted ourselves in on April 23rd. On that morning, we arrived at this gate, beyond which you can see the construction site, and across the street, on this central north-south highway, we found many of our kindred spirits with whom we would literally and figuratively link arms and, and uh, protest over the ensuing days. Many of them have been regular participants in what now is over, one, over a 5,000-day occupation in our presence, day and night. And this tented compound, several hundred yards away from the center of activity, which we'll see over the next several slides, it's a place for relief and respite from the elements and a place to sing and dance and eat and rest and share information and to strategize and to restore and to get inspiration. So that morning, walking down the street a few hundred yards away, we saw this. It's the first of the convoys that were arriving that day. Usually there were two or three such convoys and about 175 vehicles arriving uh, mostly carrying fill for the ongoing landfill project in the bay. And we greeted our fellow colleague, our colleagues with whom we would be spending a great deal of time over the following days. They'd already been seated for a couple of hours in as much as we had traveled from Naha City an hour and a half away and were joining them about two or three hours into their day. <clears throat> yes, they were predominantly elders, but there were an encouraging number of others. There were teenagers and college age folks and midlife and full-fledged full adults. 
we would learn through the week that the objective of the sustained presence of four to 500 protesters was met and surpassed. Busloads would come a daily on a, on a, a daily basis. They'd be coming from all over the island. And uh, we met many of the Japanese activists who had come down making the two hour flight from the mainland. Here you see Tarak and myself with uh, Doug Loomis. He's a former US Marine and an author and a scholar, a longtime Japan and Okinawan resident. He's written much about the situation there. He's a very engaged activist. He's been involved in the movement there for many, many years, and he's a member of the Veterans for Peace chapter there in Okinawa. He was our host and our translator. So many of the people who were seated there recognized Bruce and Tarak on our arrival. They knew us by our, the garb we were wearing, our Veterans for Peace costumes. And uh, we were greeted warmly, especially when Bruce and I unfurled this banner. So these next few slides, I hope, will give you a sense of the action and the atmosphere at the scene. In the intervals between the convoy's arrival, the crowd would build as protesters seated themselves in front of the construction entrance. The number of riot control police also would build as the hour of the convoy arrival neared. Often the protesters would be in place for hours. This time was put to good use as the leaders share the responsibility of keeping us engaged. There would be lectures and chants and songs and calisthenics. It was a great learning experience. In fact, the protesters referred to it as a college or a university. Um, <clears throat> they had a number of leaders, but they always shared with uh, the, those gathered there, I think, the, the, the uh, mic. This is one of the prominent leaders, the very prominent leader, um, uh, Hiroji Yamashiro. Hiroji Yamashiro. He's the charismatic director of the so-called Okinawa Peace Movement Center, and he seems indefatigable. He does it all, bringing an outside personality to the job, singing and lecturing and cajoling and entertaining and uh, prodding whatever it took. In October of 2016, Hiroji had been arrested for allegedly cutting a barbed wire fence around Camp Schwab and he endured six months in prison, never was uh, formally tried, and then was released. During that period of incarceration, he was denied medical treatment, denied visitations by family members, so his treatment was rather harsh. Uh, the disposition of his case has yet be de to be determined, but for the time being, he's back and has rejoined the fray in spite of the fact that he's in danger of being rearrested and uh, subject to even more draconian measures. Oh, here you see that Hiroji has uh, lent the mic to our delegation, to us Veterans for Peace. Speaking here is Tarak Koff, and he very emotionally, very emotionally expressed his love for the Okinawan people, as he was wont to do. And I think uh, he, uh, I uh, hate to suggest this, but he might have connected with the Okinawan people even more than Bruce has, simply because he lays his heart on, his heart is so uh, worn on his sleeve. Hiroji's situation, this leader, Hiroji, and his continued prominent role in the ongoing protest illuminates the curious nature of the dynamic between the riot control police and other authorities and the protesters. Even though Hiroji is at a heightened risk of being uh, re, uh, reincarcerated and subject to very serious consequences, should he be, every day he continues to play a very prominent role in what's happening there. And obviously he's respected by the uh, police force and even deferred to on occasions. It did, it did seem to me that it's a bit of a choreographed production. As long as everyone behaved within established norms, everything would be okay. We protesters were expected to adhere to nonviolent principles, and the police would do the same. We would link arms and legs, and within limits refuse to be carried away or to comply with their commands and they would physically remove us, yet rarely exceeding, in my opinion, the requisite force to pry us apart and separate each individual. They'd then haul us out one by one to a nearby holding area, carrying those of us who, were, who would not walk of our own accord. Here you might recognize this uh, ardent activist. I found this prevailing dynamic, anyway, between the uh, uh, the riot police and ourselves to be comforting and yet at the same time disturbing. Comforting because it seemed to me that there was really little risk of, uh, 
uh, that I would actually be physically harmed if I behaved myself and, and uh, acted within those established parameters. On the other hand, it was disturbing because I felt that our behavior, as long as we stayed within those norms, would be accepted and tolerated solely because they can continue with the, with the construction project at, the, at a pace that was acceptable to them. So I, I'm not trying to suggest that the dynamic was totally benign. There was plenty of intense emotion and there would inevitably be injuries or physical clashes when the, when the uh, <coughs> injuries when the physical clashes rose to a higher level. So injuries were not too uncommon. Now I've got a couple of very short videos that I hope I can operate without too much difficulty here. These couple of videos that I hope to show are only about a minute long and they do, I think, enable us to get a real sense of what the dynamic was like in the larger picture uh, on each of the occasions that the convoys arrived. Um, so this happened day after day after day, at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day. If the project is to continue uh, and to advance forward fast enough to satisfy the authorities and complete the project within an acceptable time, if they were only to rely on these truck deliveries, it would take some 46 years to bring all the film material in, the sufficient mater material to continue the project. So they're trying to transport, uh, and in fact have already begun transporting quarrying materials, fill materials from around the island, different points on the island, uh, a proposition that's in some cases requiring a couple of days of ship transport. So we went over to one of those sites on the west side of the island, about uh, 10 miles away from the Camp Schwab location, to impede the progress of that particular operation one day. And I've got a slide here that we hopefully may be able to see that I think sort of encapsulate, encapsulates uh, the, uh, the enormity of the crime being committed here. So this is just a minute long. What we're hearing is the riot police commanding their men as to what the next step is in terms of uh, removing us. It seems to be a, a matter of personal choice. I find it uh, sort of suggestive of the overall culture. You see many Oriental and Asian people wearing masks at the airports and elsewhere in the country. I think it's simply because of uh, uh, transfer of germs and uh, Okay, this gives you an idea of the transfer routes that uh, they were taking by way of ship delivery to Hinoko on the east side of the island. And you, Motobu, Motobu Bay is the area to which Bruce and I went in the last, uh, the last day or day before our last. This is that bay. It's another area that's relatively was a pristine area before it became desecrated by what's going on there. There's an open pit quarry just uh, a half a mile or so away from the harbor where we were located. We were in this parking area and we had joined other protesters in trying to impede this operation, truck delivery to the ships where they were downloading fill material to be brought around by way of sea. <clears throat> Here you see Bruce about to be hauled off. And this is a slide that I find suggestive and symbolic really of the entire uh, criminality of our role there. And that's the picture of, of of Aura Bay that I referred to earlier. So, I want to close with Nucci to Dakar, life is precious, right? Well, thank you very much. Any questions before we turn it over to Bruce? Suzanne? Yeah, yeah they've got it all. It's, uh, we were not never able to get access to the base, so I can't give you uh, a personal observation, but I suspect they've got every imaginable thing that our military people normally enjoy overseas. That base has been there for how many years? Decades, anyway, huh, Bruce? Um, 
So they're living in relative this is one comfort there. Right there um, 30, 32 military bases all over the country. Oh, so see. that's an important uh, issue. You know, we've, we occupy 20% of that island. The U.S. military occupies 20% occupies of the island. It's really an obscene occupation. And it's just, it is impossible to dismiss the fact that they are very much, U.S. military personnel are very much in presence. There's some 50,000 military personnel on the island. And uh, did I say it covers 20%, those bases cover 20% of the island? <laughs> as far as I could tell, at the end of our visit there, at the end of the, the uh, plan for five or six day event, our uh, exaggerated effort, the leaders were satisfied that we had satisfactorily impeded progress on the project. I'm not so sure what the post-mortem was, how they felt about it since then. And I, I'm thinking Bruce may again be able to further enlighten us. Oh, well, I was, <coughs> will attempt to close with what I was going to say, if I had my notes available to me, is that on the last day, Bruce and I had the opportunity to walk up the highway about a mile or so outside of town, away from all the activity at the, at the gate. And we could look off across at Aura Bay, where this landfill operation is happening. We looked across the pr pristine um, terrain out into the pristine waters of Aura Bay. And we were well aware of the endangered species, the endangered coral out there, and the fact that this whole picture that we were looking at was doomed. And I had to ask myself as I wrote home in one of my dispatches that how can our leaders accept this sort of uh, uh, outrageous proposition? Here we're talking about a $3 billion project, and we're destroying the environment, and there seems to be really no defensible need for what's happening there. It's just... It is so disturbing, and frankly, as much as I embrace this notion of Nucci de Dakar, and I think that's again a very important mantra that they that they find uh, uh, solace in. Uh, I find it. I, I just found that in conclusion, I think uh, it's difficult to avoid despair. Is that a 